Well, bless the name of the Lord. I am thankful to be with you on this Tuesday night. Just moments before I told him it was time we needed to go live. This scripture, this is not what Brother Shelton is going to speak on tonight, but I'm, I'm going to read this. It's a portion of scripture that has been um, talked about uh, numerous times on this call, on these calls. Uh, it's been talked about, been preached on, but I'm going to read it. This portion of it, if it had not been the Lord, who was on our side. Now, they Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath given, hath not given us as prey to their teeth, our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. If it had not been for the Lord. I'm glad he's on our side. I am glad that I know I want more, and I've said this over the last couple of weeks, I want more than just a revelation. I want a relationship. I don't want to just know him. But I want that intimacy with him. And uh, what we have been hearing on Tuesday nights, has been something that is building a deeper walk and fellowship and uh, relationship with him. Dealing with the spirit, with the gifts of the spirit and being able uh, Tuesday night last week, Brother Shelton, you dealt with diverse kinds of tongues. And you made a statement about an individual that you did not name that uh, gave out three messages in tongues. And everything come to a stop uh, and he was told that he needed to give the interpretation. I recently was in a service, and it almost happened that way. My, I, I cannot tell you how much of a knot, now there's only so much of a knot a big fella can get in, Oh, you just, you know, but, but you can, you can get a certain amount and, uh, but there was a very strong interpretation that came from that. And, uh, it's things like this that causes you to start observing more closely with what we've been hearing. I uh, my dad is a carpenter by trade <laughs> that's all I've known is building but finish work is his uh, expertise I've said it he will one of the tools that he uses is a electric pencil sharpener. 
and he uses a number two pencil and he will go through several pencils on a cabinet job because he will sharpen that pencil, make a mark or two, and he will resharpen it. And he will tell you, you barely can see that little thin line, and he'll say, now split that line. He wants it that cut so precise. And uh, we walked into a place one day, and we was looking around. Dave was with me, and he said, uh, well, I can tell you one thing. Papa didn't do this trim work. And uh, I started looking at it, and I went, no. And he didn't mark it either. <laughs> <coughs> it's, uh, that's, that's what's going on. This, if you will listen, this is honing our spirits to be in tune and in touch. Well, what a way to start a Tuesday night. What a way. What a way. Brother Shelton, I don't know. Well, I do know where we're at, but I don't know what's going to be said. But I, 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 I know that the Lord has been uh, speaking to us. And if you're just tuning in, we have been dealing with 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning the spiritual gifts, and we're down to diverse kinds of tongues is where we were at, and the interp and another interpretation. And uh, I, I've been really looking forward to tonight to see what the Holy Ghost is going to say to us. And uh, we are honored, privileged, thankful, all the above for the man of God that is speaking to us on these Tuesday nights. And uh, uh, we do rejoice in the Holy Ghost that we are so much better off in the spirit than we were. Amen. Again, welcome to Tuesday night. Brother Shelton, I'm going to turn this to you. And I, I mean, I'm not going to come take, I'm not going to shut it off. I'm not going to, I'm going to just let you know up front. I'm not going to shut it off. I'm not going to pull your coattail. We're not going to flip your camera. Uh, none of that. Uh, so they don't need to mask us tonight. We're just going, we're going, we're going to listen with anticipation, but we do love and appreciate you. That was a little bit of, I, I can't get, I, I just can't get as uh, rough as I have heard it said. So that's about as rough as it gets. Uh, we love and appreciate you and uh, talk to us. Well, I give honor to you, Brother Bourne and Sister Bourne, and I thank the Lord for both of you. Um, I've been enjoying these Tuesday nights and these few verses here. And uh, kind of feeling a few things bumping around in my spirit, but we could. I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And um, let's see. I want to start with verse four, just do a little recap. And I, I am so very thankful for Brother and Sister Born and their friendship and their walk with God. And these Tuesday nights have been such a tremendous blessing to me. And, um, I, I, I know, I guess I'm doing the majority of the talking on them, but I got to tell you, I feel like I'm being, I'm the one that's being blessed the most. And um, 
this morning, early Malachi looked at me and said, Daddy, are you preaching tonight? Is tonight the night you preach online? I said, yes. And he turned around and told one of his siblings, see, I told you. And it just kind of cracks me up a little bit, but it, it makes me happy to know that rather than is tonight the night this TV show or that TV show comes on. It's is tonight the night you preach in Houston online. And uh, being able to do this every Tuesday night has developed uh, some expectations in my family and in my kids. And I'm thankful for it. Thankful for the word. Uh, I, I remember that and I've told you, I won't belabor it, but I remember as a teenager, especially my mom, and she's probably watching and I give honor to her, my wife and kids, <clears throat> but my mother was then and is still a student of the word and a person who loves the word. My mother is not a casual observer of the Word of God. My mother is an intent and intensive studier and searcher of the Word. That's what Jesus said do was search the Scriptures. My mother's a searcher. There were times as a kid we'd come in from school and um, she'd get She'd pick us up. We'd get home and she'd start supper somewhere around three thirty, four o'clock, depending on what we were going to have. <clears throat> and she always tried to have supper ready around the time my dad was going to get home. And um, we'd have the table set and we'd have everything ready to go. And when he got home, we'd get the food on the table and boy, we'd go. There were some times I came through the house and my mother would have turned the fires off on the food on the stove and she'd have her Bible out on the table and be on the phone with Jerry Dyson or Melba or somebody and they'd be talking about the Word of God and it drove me nuts because while I knew the scripture was important and significant uh, right now, it's what's preventing supper from getting done. And my appreciation and my value of and for scripture really didn't hit full stride till I was in my 20s. And that's when it really seemed to start becoming more and more apparent to me that I needed to give myself to that. There was a song we used to sing that said, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And this, this thing we call the Word of God, the Scriptures, they're like that. Every day that you read it and study it and give yourself to it, it's sweeter than it was the day before. It never gets old. You never, I've told you, I preach the exact same one one verse of scripture for nine and a half ten months three times a week in revival at Antioch and I don't remember ever saying the same thing twice and there was so much that came out of one verse ten months worth of revival and a great number of people received the Holy Ghost and just got to the point I didn't even take a Bible or nothing with me to the pulpit. They'd, they'd put that on the overhead. We'd all read it together. And off we'd go. That's how rich the word is. And I am thankful for it. Verse number four. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations. But it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. Or to one is given by the Spirit 
the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit, um, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of the the gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now that's all the stuff we have read uh, heretofore and kind of broke down a little bit. And obviously I'm, I'm not going to be foolish enough to try to convey to you that I think we have done the greatest, most in-depth study of all times on any one of these uh, gifts of the Spirit. But <clears throat> we have delved into them. I'm looking uh, up a verse here right quick in Strong's. And um, I think we've the Lord's helped us to get um, some wisdom and understanding about it all. Um, but there are there are some things that I have said on multiple occasions, and I want to say again. Um, None of these gifts of the Spirit are for our personal benefit. Not only are they not for our financial benefit, but they are not there for your reputation's benefit. And if, if I spend my life making sure if I... If I and every man's got to follow peace with God and do what you feel like the Lord wants you to do. And there's a difference in what the Lord wants you to do and what the Lord lets you get away with. <clears throat> but if, if for me, the gifting, the gifts of the Spirit, becomes something that I introduce myself as, if I tell you, well, I have a reputation for being used in these gifts. I just took God. I don't care what you say. That comment or any variation of it just took God out of the picture. If I'm trying to convey to you how God used me and I'm having to tell you. God uses me this way. and God uses me that way. I have negated scripture stuff like a man's gift will make a place for itself in the kingdom. One translation says a man's gifting will take him before great men. And that's talking about men of influence and power, even in government, leaders in the community, etc. <clears throat> so the minute I start promoting myself in any of these gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, revelation, discerning of spirits, prophecy, the whole nine yards, it doesn't matter which one it is. If I present to you, hi, I'm Scott Shelton, and God really uses me in this area of the ministry. This is what I am. Uh, I, I have a reputation for this. We can debate this and argue about it till the cows come home tomorrow. But I'm still going to be right at the end of the day. You have taken, if, if that's what we do, we have taken him out of it and made it about me. Why do I need to let you know that God uses me in certain areas of the giftings more than he does other areas of the gifts? Why, should, why would I tell you that? And if the answer is, well, I need you to know. I told y'all about the individual that came to me one time. And said, Brother Shelton, I need you to pray for me that God will start revealing things to me about people. I said, what in the wide world for? This individual said, well, uh, I believe if I know things about people and I can tell them things about themselves that there's no way I would know. Then I can have their attention. They'll know that God's talking to them. And then 
I can teach them a Bible study because now I've got their attention. But the scripture doesn't say that you'll be exposed to the gifts of the Spirit and be set free by them. The scripture, the scripture doesn't bring the gifts of the Spirit into, um, as far as I know, into the new birth. You know what the new birth is all about? Truth. The scripture says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The gifts of the spirit, that's only a tool to get you to the truth. The gifts don't save anybody. Their operation makes it possible for the salvation of the Lord and the saving power of God to flow through uh, into some places and minister to us as needed. But just because I've got some gift operating in my life doesn't mean that I'm going to have any real eternal value to your life, especially if the truth is not involved. And I think sometimes we've got people more interested in gifts than they are truth, more acquainted with gifts than they are with truth. <clears throat> Verse number seven, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit withal. That does not mean that word profit there does not mean to personally benefit. That means withal there means it's all inclusive. Whatever gifting is operating in you at that moment should be beneficial to everybody in that room somehow or another. And your gift should function in unison with another gift. Again, one more time, the gifts of the spirit are not there to grease the skids of an individual. They are not there to bring about notoriety and acclaim for a personality. They're not there for that. Now there is confirmation, signs and wonders shall follow them which believe, etc. And that individual that asked me, will you pray for me that God will show me things about people? Um, I said, absolutely not. And they wanted to know why. And I said, because I'm going to tell you, like Brother Barnes told me, the Lord's not a peeping Tom. And I'm not going to pray that the Lord would or anybody else would enable you to dig around in somebody's personal business, to impress them or intimidate them. And I'm going to tell you something. A misuse of the gifts of the Spirit, especially revelatory gifts, Misuse of them is either going to be done intentionally or unintentionally. It doesn't matter. Probably the two primary things that will happen is um, it's going to it, it's going to be done to impress or intimidate someone and. If I intimidate you, then I can control you. If I impress you enough, I can influence you, which is control. So the gifts of the Spirit are not for any of those things. The gifts of the Spirit are for the collective good of the kingdom of God and for the benefit of the body of Christ to help us overcome whatever. Now, verse 11. Again, you go from verse 4, uh, introducing us to, to the fact that there are diversities of gifts. There's multiple gifts here, he says. And then he says, but there's one spirit. There's differences of administrations. They are applied differently. But the same Lord. And their operations are going to be different, he says. But the same God worketh in all of them. 
So it doesn't matter how the gifts manifest themselves. As long as it's done in accordance to the word and the will of God, same spirit, same purpose, same end result. That's why I get very concerned. And I've said this on here a number of times. And if you think I'm pot shotting you, then I, whoever it could be, that's not the case. I have heard this said for 30 plus years of ministry, Brother Bourne. I've heard people talk about teaching people how to operate the gifts. And I've covered this on here before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time rehashing it. Our job is to be sensitive to the spirit of the Lord, learn his voice, listen for his voice, and obey his voice. And I get asked a lot of times, Brother Shelton, how do I operate in the gifts? Well, it's a one-word answer. for, for if, if you're asking me, it's a one-word answer. Obedience. Just be obedient to what he wants you to do, where he wants you to do it, involving whomever he wants involved, and say whatever it is he's told you to say, and when he's through, you be through. Don't add to it. Don't try to tack something else on it. If it's a one word statement to someone, it does not matter. Say only what God said to say. I've walked up to people at times, Brother Bourne, and, and felt such a presence of God and faith and expectancy and just it would have been easy in a church service or not in a church service. It wouldn't matter. It would have been easy to have just blown the whole thing up right then and there. Just, my God. But the Lord won't even let you reveal what you're feeling. He don't want your emotions involved. He simply wants the word that he gave to be delivered. And you have to go tell him. And it might be one sentence. Might be one paragraph. It might be one word, but it's enough. And, and we do make stuff about us that's not about us. And that's why I have a problem. And, and I guess you can blame it on my apostolic influences and in, in my coming up in the kingdom. Uh, but Brother Barnes left an indelible imprint on me. The, the few occasions that I had to be around Brother Marvin Cole impacted me. My bishop, Brother Wright, has absolutely impacted and changed and shaped and molded my life. One of the things that I've noticed about all of them and some others that I have had opportunities to be around, it never has been about them. As a matter of fact, one of the things I noticed about them was it's always about them deferring to somebody else. Always wanting some of the greatest, most powerful apostolic people I have ever known. Always had a desire and actively involved themselves in including other people to be a part of what they were doing. If there was ministry to be done, it wasn't uncommon for them to hand the mic off. If somebody needed prayer, they would call for someone else to come over and pray for them. It was never a one-man show. They would scan that room, and wh wherever the Lord pointed them and whatever he told them to do, they did it. And when he was done with them and told them to hand the mic to somebody else or involve somebody else, they did it. We've got folks in the kingdom that will not, they will not advocate for somebody else's ministry because they feel like it threatens their job security. I know that for a straight up fact. 
and and these men that were so powerfully used of God, one of the key fundamental things I noticed about them that they all had in common, and, and ladies too, not just men of God, but women of God. One of the things that I noticed about all of them was one of the base characteristics that they had was humility. It never has been about them. It's always about Jesus. And they never wanted to do whatever ministry they were called on to do in such a way as to leave the entire room looking at them. Brother Barnes told the story about when uh, he was doing a big healing crusade there in Minden. And he went and got two sheets of plywood and hung them from his side of his truck, had it fixed up, I think, on a boat rack or whatever, um, and had it attached on the sides and had painted on the sides uh, T.W. Barnes or Tom Barnes, whichever it was, Healing Crusade, and had a megaphone and was driving through the town with his little megaphone out the window doing his own PR work and advertising and promoting the, the crusade. And he said he was standing back looking at his handiwork and observing that truck with those sheets of plywood on the side, his mobile billboards. And he said, the Lord spoke to him. He said, Tom Barnes healing crusade, huh? He said, yes, sir. The Lord spoke back to him and said, never heard of one. And in the course of the next couple of minutes of conversation, the Lord let him know, you can go ahead and have that if you want to, but I won't be there. And he said he started running to that truck, hollering, praying, saying it out loud. Hold on, Lord, hold on just a minute. I'm sorry, I repent. He ripped them billboards off the side of his truck. And it was not going to be about Tom Barnes. I guess I, I watched, again, it was not much, just a few times that I was able to be around Brother Cole and observe just him as a man, so humble, and just didn't, wasn't there to try to draw attention to himself. And so when I see a person who's, character is I want you to know about me and my gifts at that moment you've lost all credibility with me now maybe I'm just an old prude and and I'm just a, a mean old guy and uh, if I am brother Bourne's not going to turn the camera off on his end he said but you can turn me off at your house if you want to but if if you are trying to use the gifts to impress other people in your life so that everybody knows that you're spiritual and everybody knows you hear from God. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to believe this, but it's the truth. Seven days a week, 365. If, and this, I'm not original with this. I heard it and I'm repeating it. If you've got to tell somebody you're the boss, you are not the boss. I told y'all, I think about Top Dog. Did I tell y'all about Top Dog? My friend's daughter didn't know who Bishop was. And her sister said, well, you know, he's because she's the, the baby girl said, what is the bishop? And the middle sister looked at her and said, well, it's the Top Dog. And never having met or seen that man before, Bishop come walking through the sanctuary their first Sunday there. And she picked him out and she said, Daddy, is that top dog? <laughs> Authority and anointing doesn't have to be announced by the person carrying it. Yeah, but what if people don't know who I am and know what I am? And why would you want to be any different than Jesus? Do you think, do we think, do I think, are we foolish and stupid enough to think that the gifts of the Spirit being present and resident and operational in our lives is going to make everybody receive us? 
but I've got to promote myself so everybody will know how God uses me so they'll receive what I've got to say. You're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. If you're going, everybody wants to be like Jesus, hold your hand up. I got mine up. All right, y'all all did. Then if we really want to be like Jesus, I can't promote my ministry to make everybody receive me. Because the scripture says that he came to his own and they received him not. The scripture doesn't say he came unto his own and some of them received him not. The scripture just puts it out as a blanket statement, an entire nation of people, his people. He came unto his own and his own received him not. So do I really think that it is just and right for me to expect that the gifts of the spirit were given to us to make us everybody's buddy and to make everybody like us and everybody want to be with us and everybody want it. Matter of fact, uh, if you're really used in the Holy ghost and you really are a mouthpiece of the Lord and you really do what the Lord tells you to do, it's not going to be an uncommon event from time to time in your life to be rejected. And when people reject you, you don't get to use the gifts to beat them up with. You don't get to use the gifts to get money out of somebody's pocket and into your own. You don't get to walk into your room and use the discernment that God has given you inappropriately and discern who in there is sympathetic to a underdog and then go and present yourself to them like an underdog. I'm always, you, you know, it's, it's probably, I'm not okay with somebody just straight up lying to a brother, but when someone is telling you all of their woes to solicit something out of your pocket. You don't need to listen to that. These gifts are not for us to run around and tell somebody uh, just for the fun of it, what they had for breakfast. The Lord may show you and he may let you. And there are times that the Lord has done that and that was needed and necessary to bring about the fear of God. But it's not for me to decide when it's time for that to happen and when it's not. It's not my call to say, okay, you know what? Right now I'm fixing to use this discernment. I'm fixing to use these revelatory gifts and I'm fixing to see and know and I'm going to tell you some stuff and I'm going to put the fear of God in you. And I've seen that done. You just took God out of the equation. This is no longer about him. This is about me having a point to prove. Yeah, but how will they know if they don't know? How will they know when God's talking and what God's trying to do if they don't know about who I am, what I am? Well, go back and look at what Jesus said. The works I do, I do not of myself. Then he turns around and says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Is the one statement a statement of humility and the other one a statement of pride? No. What he was saying is, I'm not doing what I'm doing of my own accord and by my own power, and by my own strength. What you see me do is actually him doing it through me. I'm just Geppetto's puppet, buddy. I'm just doing what I'm made to do. That's why when, when I see ministries where it's all about personality, I don't trust them. I, I do not trust all of that stuff. 
all of the dramatics and the flair and the hoopla. Uh, I, 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 I struggle to be able to even sit in a room and listen to it. <clears throat> These gifts are necessary for the body. But it's just like mercy. If we take advantage of these gifts, we can hurt somebody with them. And we can destroy our own soul in the process of that. The gifts of the Spirit are not mine to use or abuse, nor are they mine to teach you how to use them or abuse them. The gifts of the Spirit are given born out of, birthed out of, manifested from a relationship with God. And if you've got more gifts than you've got relationships, something's out of whack. If your entire kingdom focus and ministry is more about my, if it's more about I, me, and my, and my gifts and my ministry and, and not about relationship, I worry about fellas who travel full time and, and men who are always so busy, 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 busy. You can't tell me you've got a relationship with God when you are going seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and you look at your calendar and there's nowhere in there at all to come up and catch a breath, to spend time with him. And eventually we bankrupt. Without that relationship, eventually everything crumbles. Everything falls to the ground and dies. These gifts are necessary for the body. They're powerful. Look at verse 11. But all these worketh continuously, that one and the self-same spirit. Now remember in verse 4, he started out talking about diversities of administrations and uh, a diversity of gifts and diversities of operations. And he kept coming back to one spirit, one spirit, one Lord, one God, same God. Remember that? So then he gets into what all the gifts are. And then to reiterate the point again, after we've discussed and devoured and divulged all we can about the gifts, then he comes back and he says, in verse 11, but however, don't forget, all of these gifts worketh. There will never be a time these gifts are not working for this purpose. ETH means it's a continual situation. So there's always going to be gifts, always going to be one spirit, one Lord, one God pushing, moving, doing all of this, purposing all of this. And they will always have the same purpose. And they will always be driven. By the self-same spirit, he says. Dividing to every man, severally, as he will. For as the body, again, with all of this stuff, all of these powerful gifts, he comes back over and over and over and reiterates the unity of the body. You can say, I'm humble, and follow that with, and God uses me, X, Y, Z. You, you just blew your humility, your false humility, right out of the water. First of all, humility, just like anointing, does not have to be introduced. You don't have to know what gifts of the Spirit somebody is used primarily with. You just need to know, do I feel Jesus when I'm around them? Do I feel peace when I'm around them? Yes. Then if if God gives them a word for me and I feel a witness in my spirit to that, say on. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, it makes no difference of your origins. 
Whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm the hand, I'm not the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Is the foot the body? No, but it is of the body. It's part of the body. It's not the body within itself, but it is within the body a vital part. The gifts of the Spirit are not intended by God to set us aside from everybody else. The gifts of the Spirit were never intended to be a calling card or a business card. They were never intended by God for us to use them to create this elitist mentality that I'm used in these gifts and I'm used in those gifts and God does That's not supposed to be the topic. That's not supposed to be the attention getter. To God be the glory. Brother, you were used so powerfully tonight. Well, praise God. Thank the Lord. And move on. Who cares what I'm known for? Who cares what my reputation is? Who cares what people think about me? I had a man tell me publicly while I was yet standing in his pulpit. He said, he's, he's sitting over there in his chair on the platform. And I turned and spoke to him, just kind of lighthearted comments there, getting ready to preach. He said, you know what we call you, don't you? I said, I have no idea. He said, Scott, the bulldozer Shelton, and just stared at me. Well, <laughs> I couldn't care less. I don't care what you call me or if you call me at all. What I need to know is, did you feel the Holy Ghost at all? Was the Lord able to minister to you? I don't want a reputation. I don't want to be known for anything. Other than, and I've told you this before, obedience. If you have to only say one thing at my funeral, should I die before any of y'all? But I'm telling you, I'm going to be 101 if the Lord don't come back. I'm going to just live to be 101. I've never done it. I'm going to give it a shot. And, and I'm on my way, well on my way. Uh, another 45 years and I'll nail that thing. Pow. But at the end of my life, if that's tomorrow in another 40 years, should the Lord tarry, if there's only one thing you can say about me at my funeral and you can't think of anything else, I pray to God you're able to say he was obedient. That's it. I, I just want it to be known to him that I will do anything he asked me to do. You want to use me in the gifts? Fine. You don't want to use me in the gifts this week? No problem. I don't care. I have no agenda. I have no need to have an agenda. I just need to be obedient. I tease about it a lot of times because there's. it's often, it's not unusual for me to be somewhere in church and, and <laughs> pandemonium just break out and the Lord just do all kind of stuff and I don't even preach. And, and I have guys that from time to time, they feel bad. They're like, man, I am so sorry. I, and I'm thinking, what, are you kidding me? Don't apologize for this. How do you think the Lord's been waiting to just have his way? We say that all the time. Well, I want the Lord to have his way. And then we don't let him. Did he minister to his body? Yes. Did he use just me to do it? No. Then the kingdom has been served. And the will of God has been done. And I tease about it because I'm like, you know what? Sometimes a fella needs to know what it is God wants to say through him for sure. And it's also important to know when you're not necessary. <laughs> and sometimes our need to be used of God gets in the way of what God's trying to do. He's telling us these gifts are not to illuminate you. These gifts are not to make you famous. These gifts are not to get your calendar booked. These gifts are not so people will promote you as a prophet or as an apostle or as an evangelist or as a teacher or as a pastor. <clears throat> I 
one of the things about Christ that so amazes me was he had no identity of his own. The only thing he had, really, and this is the only way I know how to put it, that was his own, was a specific call and purpose from the Father. And to achieve the will of God in his life, Christ had to live without an agenda. If he's our example, then maybe I need to ask myself, am I living with an agenda? Am I struggling with the Lord trying to get him to get on board with my agenda, with my plan, with my program, with what I think, what I feel, what I... Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? These gifts, we, we were not designed as the body of Christ not to have them. We were designed for these gifts to flow through us severally as he wills. He can use one gift in a person their entire life and never use one of the other gifts. But that's his will. That's his, his design for their life, his purpose for their life. Should they feel deficient and say, well, I've only ever been used in one gift? No. They should not feel that way. They should be able to say with head held high and spirit humbled, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. I just want to be available for whatever purpose you have designed for me on any given day. And no more than a fellow should be in any way feeling lesser because he was only used in one gift, nor should another person be you, feel elevated and special because God may have used them in multiple gifts. And as I have said on here before, I am going to say it again. And probably again and again and again until Jesus comes. It is not a sign of uber spirituality when you say, I want to be used in all nine gifts. It's not a declaration of superior spirituality. For me to tell you, God uses me in all nine gifts. I, he uses me in all nine gifts. I know what I said, but my implication is, this isn't everybody, but he uses me in all nine gifts. Again, find in scripture where the, Jesus said that. Find in scripture where Paul boasted of it. What does the scripture say? If you speak with the language of angels and have not love, so what is the balance to the gifts of the spirit? Now, I know a lot of apostolic people don't like that word balance because in their minds, that translates to we just can't be full-fledged apostolic. And that when you use the word balance, that somehow decries to them compromise, backing off, not being fully apostolic. That's not what I'm saying. So don't get that twisted up. The balance to the gifts of the Spirit has to exist. You can't believe in heaven and not believe in hell. You can't believe in God and not believe there's a devil. You can't believe in right and not believe in wrong. It's impossible. You can't believe there's an up if you don't believe there's a down. You can't believe in light. How can a person believe in light if they don't believe in darkness? If you think darkness don't exist, then there's no light either. There'd be no need for it. 
Well, then what's this around us? Exactly. If we're going to believe the gifts of the Spirit are there to help us help others, what did he give that I should have in my life every single day to help me be saved? I mentioned this last night in Conway. The kingdom of heaven, the scripture says, is not. There are some things the kingdom of heaven is not. It's not meat. It's not drink. It's not about carnal things. It's not about physical things. The kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, joy. On and on and on that scripture goes. This thing we're part of in the kingdom is not physical, it's not natural, and it's not carnal. It is spiritual. All day long, every single day of your life, the kingdom of heaven is spiritual. And for all of you from Conway, I'm not going to rehash last night. But I enjoyed last night. But God wants these gifts to work in us. Whether it's one always or a different one every day, or only one for the entirety of your life. He wants those gifts operational in his body. But something has to exist to keep us conditioned so that those gifts can, number one, find a way to flow through us, and number two, not be tainted by my flesh when it comes through the vessel. Bishop Wright's always talking about being a conduit. Now, I'm going to just tell you something right now. The condition of that conduit's important. Well, now, Brother Shelton, okay. You just go right on out here. You go right on out here, get you, a, go down here to the great RV park somewhere. You find you somebody's got their coach or fifth wheel or whatnot pulled up out there. And their black water tank, they hit the button and that thing says full. They turn it on. They turn on the water nozzles inside the tank to help rinse the tank out. And they drain that tank, man. That thing just down that black water. That sewer, by the way, black water. Out it goes. I don't know one person, Bishop. Not one. Even after the fellow that owns that coach pushed that button and did a little rinse inside that, and just whoosh, I don't know one person that would walk up and say, hey, can I use your black water tank hose to run over here and hook up to take a shower with? You get a good solid water hose out here and siphon out a septic tank with it. And then ask somebody you know, hey, y'all want to drink water? You just run that, siphon that potty water through that thing. Yeah, but I turned on the water and just rinsed it out. Oh, no. I still believe that's going to taste like potty water. I'm not drinking that. Conduit. This will grow some of y'all out worse than the potty water. But I got a Stanley coffee thermos, one of them big green ones. All my Yeti cups, all my insulated coffee cups. Don't let me catch you washing one of them with Dawn dish soap. Because if you get that soap in there too much and you get that water too hot, that metal will expand. And that, that particular container, I got one right now, tastes like Dawn dishwashing soap three years after somebody ran it full of hot water and Dawn soap and let it just soak. Can't get it out. I quit using it. 
Try to burp a bubble or something. For goodness sake. Okay. Are y'all with me? Stay with me now. I'm about to go to my seat. So you saying you don't wash them? I didn't say that. You can use vinegar to wash a cough pot and it won't taste like vinegar. But you go ahead and run some good solid hot water and soak through there and there's a high possibility. People come to my house and want to drink coffee and they'll look down in my old coffee pot, my insulated deal on my bun coffee maker. And they'll look in there and see a little coffee stain. And they want to run over the sink and go to scrubbing and scraping around with a sponge. And Oh, what have you done? You introduced some foreign object into a pristine environment. And it takes me, I don't know, 15, 20 pots before that, everything, that thing ever gets back to normal. You want to wash it, get you a fresh sponge, no soap, hot water, and scrub around on it. A little vinegar, maybe. Don't be putting no soap in it. It matters what we put in these vessels. It matters what you let come through your life. It matters what you listen to. It matters what you hear. It matters the conversations you give yourself to. It matters about the music you listen to. And I'm going to go ahead and say it because somebody needs to hear it. Don't come up and start prophesying to me when you've been listening to Elton John or L Lady Gaga or somebody off out here in Never Never Land. Don't be talking about purple rain then come up to me and talk about I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, hush. We're not doing that. <clears throat> this thing here has to stay clean. But our flesh is what it is. So how does he help us? Do we make mistakes? Do we stumble and fall? Yes. But if we, if we follow biblical instruction and principles, we get up and that flesh is out of our system with the blood of the lamb again. The only thing that can keep the vessel clean is the blood. I repent of mistakes but very rarely do we repent over choices. We will make a decision. I'm not going to church. We'll make a decision. I know pastors preaching holiness, but I'm going to live the way I want to. That person will never repent. And that person's going to bust hell wide open. I know what the word of God says about righteous living, but I don't want to live that way. I don't think I should have to. You're contaminated. And your gifts can't be trusted. And your ministry can't be trusted. And according to that book, that's iniquity. And you're going to go to hell with that. Hello, somebody. So what do you give us? To keep us with the right attitude and the right spirit. To help us not make wrong choices. And to help us to repent quickly when we fall. Well, conviction, I know, but something's got to keep this, this vessel, this conduit conditioned and soft enough and sensitive enough that conviction can get our attention. Because I've been around people, you have too, that have hardened themselves so much against conviction that when it comes in the room, everybody else is in the altar praying and they're standing around thinking, oh my God, when are they going to be? Get up and leave right in the middle of church because they don't like the preacher they don't like the music. They don't like the move of God. This is stupid. Y'all are praying too long. And we'll get up and go sit in the parking lot or just go on to that restaurant or the house. What, what did he give us to prevent that stuff? And, and Bishop, unless I'm mistaken, I may find myself headed in that direction next week. I have never been one to set a goal of ministry or topics for myself. But I today I have been feeling drawn this direction to go after we're through here to the fruit of the Spirit. I had a man call me, and I told you all this, but I had a man call me one time, and he said, I want to talk to you about the gifts of the Spirit. I said, okay, what about them? 
Well, I want to come spend time with you, and, and I want us to discuss uh, all the gifts of the Spirit and the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, and I want to know uh, about the functions of the gifts of the Spirit, and I want to know, and I want to know, and I want to know. And so I said to him, that's fine, but I need you to know this. Before we agree on a date uh, for you to come, I want you to know that when you get here, need to have about three days set aside. First day, we're going to talk about the mighty God, who he is. Second day, we're going to talk about the fruit of the spirit. We're going to talk about the, the mighty God and the new birth on day one. Day two, we're going to spend all day that we're together talking about the fruit of the spirit. And then on day three, we'll get into the gifts. And I waited for him to say something. He didn't say anything. I said, are you there? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, when, when do you think you can come? He said, I'll get back to you. That was in about 1996 or seven. Never heard from him again. There have got to be characteristics of Christ as well as the power of God in our lives. Has to be. We cannot do this just on power and demonstration. But the kingdom of heaven has to be there too. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. The gifts of the Spirit are powerful. So is the fruit of the Spirit. You should not trust my ministry if you can't find any of the fruit of the Spirit resident here. You should be very careful and cautious about receiving anything that I might say if you don't feel the nature of God as well as hear the word of God. The scripture says that even judgment should be administered with love. These gifts, and I, I got a feeling, Brother Bourne, we're going to come back around. We may circle back around and do the gifts again before we get to fruit. I don't know just yet. <clears throat> I feel like there's, obviously, I know there's much more depth that we didn't even really get into with these things, but we are living in perilous times, obviously, but they're not just perilous. We are living in times where everybody's got a camera, everybody's recording something, and everybody is Googling something. You think I'm overstating the obvious with talking about the fruit of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit? You think I'm overstating? Some of y'all are probably sick of hearing me say stuff. Cautionary statements like, be careful, don't misuse them, don't let the enemy let you make these things all about us. If you think I'm overstating it, get on YouTube. You spend enough time on there anyway, it's not like it'll be a departure from the norm. The only departure from the norm will be what you're looking at, not the amount of time you're on it. So get on there. It's your normally appointed time. And, and look up some of the foolishness that's on there. There's a guy that had a ministry over here in Oklahoma. I believe where it was. And uh, it was not the Azusa Street guy. And um, he's got a lot of books in print. He's, he's dead now, but you can get on there. And I've been in church services where people were drunk in the Holy Ghost, slain in the spirit. That, that's, that's normal for sanctified people. But you can get on there and you can watch. And I'm not talking about the sincerity of the people in the room. I'm talking about the foolishness 
manipulating the sincerity from a pulpit. Some of the stuff that you can encounter on YouTube, don't take my word for it, look it up. Some of the goofy stuff that is done and said in pulpits lends itself heavily to me telling us, let's be cautious. Let's be sure about what we're doing and about what we're saying lest we find ourselves contributing to somebody's deception, to somebody being wounded and hurt. Are y'all with me? I hope you are. Because eternity is ultimately what's being affected by what we do and say. There's, there's not too much, and I'm going to my seat, but there's not too much. It's not possible to say, well, you've said too much about this or that. That's, that's, that's not possible. To overstate the absolute need and importance for godly character to be right alongside powerful demonstration of the Spirit. Just because God reveals something to you don't mean he wants you to tell it. Just because a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom comes to you does not mean that God wants you telling that and spewing it off out there for everybody to hear so that everybody knows you know something. I'm going, I'm going to end with this. Power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost is going to accompany and be vitally interwoven within time harvest and revival. But God is not going to be mocked and made a mockery of by carnal people who want to appear as a whited sepulcher and be full of dead man's bones. Denying the power thereof, denying the blood, denying righteousness. We want to talk about all the things we shouldn't do, and I'm all about it. Let's preach against sin all day long, every day. But just as important as we should know what not to do, we should also know what to do. Just as importantly as we should know how not to live, we sanctified people should also know how to live and not just a good idea or some religion. What does he expect out of me? We want to talk about what he wants to do through us, but what does he expect from us? And if I'm not given what he expects from me, I can't expect him to do anything through me. Now you know what I know for today. Bishop, that's what I know. And I'm going to my seat. Doesn't the Bible talk about desiring the gifts of the Shelton? Yes, sir. There's one thing to desire it. It's another thing to possess the, that gift. When you look at that, when you look at that one, that one word that it's pronounced so many different ways, but you said withal or withal. To bear together. This is the 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 Greek from Strong's G four eight five one. To bear together, to collect, 
to conduce, especially be better far to bring together to profit. <coughs> it's, it's there. The spirit, I'm not trying to go back on it, but I, 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 it just taught me, I, I, if God wants to use me in all nine gifts, but I'm not going to get no four by eight sheet of plywood and put on there. J.J. Board Jr. Ministries. Working of all nine gifts. And, and I'm going to say this, I've got the coughs and uh, I'm liable to break loose, start coughing again, and then somebody else has to close this out. This word of wisdom that some people says they have, they don't have a word of wisdom. Oh. And the word of knowledge, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go country on you a minute. For those some that says they have the word of knowledge, you got a good old case of the gift of suspicion. Yes. <laughs> and you think, well, we've heard it over this week, and this is all I'm going to say in backing up and taking parts of it. When you work in the gift of suspicion, back up about four or five weeks ago, you're dealing in divination. And when you are my dad looked at me one night and he said, either God said it or God didn't say it. And if God didn't say it, don't go lying on God. I like that. He said, now you may feel the, an impression of the Holy Ghost or an impression. It may not even be the Holy Ghost. He said, but don't go lying on God. He said, because if you don't know for sure God said it, there ain't no need to even open your mouth. And, and people say, well, I've got a word of wisdom. No, you don't. Because there's been some words that was supposed to be a word of wisdom that just flat out threw me into a tailspin. And I've lived in this. All. So it's, this has been and is still a great, great Tuesday nights. I am not going to use that word series. No, that's just, that's not what it's been. And I'm going to say this too. Because I got I to gotta get it out. Don't come up here saying you're going to, mm -mm. I'm going to borrow the meme that I've seen on Facebook. That same spirit that uh, they say that it cause you to talk in tongues will make you apologize in English. Don't come in with no bad spirit. One of the worst spirits I ever seen, Brother Shelton. And you can call me judging or whatever you want to. I listen to an individual. Now, I'm not racial profiling anybody. It was just a saying that we had. And I don't know how else to say it. They talked no saying they talked in tongues like a Chinaman. I'm not being ugly, but that's that's exactly what I thought. I listened to this person. I'm talking about they didn't even get a whole name out. And they were just they were off in it. And in ten minutes they were in the parking lot cussing and I wanted to go out there and say, we're close to a truck stop. You don't need to talk that way. There's truckers down there.
that's that's reaching and walking up to that RV and saying, let me borrow that black water hose. Not a black water hose. The black water disposal, disposal hose. And let me go down here and get me a drink of water. Not going to happen. I want the Holy Ghost to be my word of wisdom to me to know. See, see that wisdom business will make you hit delete on a text just as much as it'll keep your mouth shut. Well, that's not going to cost you nothing either. Thank you for being with us. Uh, care groups are going on. Um, prayer Saturday evening at six o'clock. Had to. I'm the one set the time, and I couldn't even remember. There at the church. Then Sunday. Let me quickly. Starting Sunday. Am I right, brother? I can't see. I got the cameras too little, brother. Benavides. I'm. I'm having to make you back make you back bigger Sunday night. You still ain't got that thing working. This is the way you do it. I still can't get it. Um, so Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. And then at two 30 channel view is going on. And Santorio Apostolico is going on at 2.30. We're moving it from 4.30 to 2.30. So keep that in mind. That'll help. Uh, it's going to be a great time. And uh, so we've started announcing that. We are, that will be in the loop that way. Uh, it will say Domingo 2.30 p.m. Hey, Amen. Look at that. I'm learning Spanish already. I know more than taco now. God bless you in Jesus' name. If you need us, give us a call. Love y'all. Praying for you. Pray that all goes well the rest of the week.